All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the MPH epidemiology program at the Dalana School of Public Health. Um, we'll talk a, a little bit about what epidemiology is, um, what you can expect from the program, the way that our program is designed and laid out. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, the application process. A lot of those other pieces will come from information sessions from the grad office. Um, but at, at any rate, this will cover um, things that are specific to the epidemiology program. All right, so what is epidemiology? I feel like I don't have to go over this as much as I've had to do in prior years because of the COVID pandemic. I feel like uh, more people know what an epidemiologist is or what epidemiology is than perhaps ever before. But I think you can broadly define it as the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states, so not just necessarily diseases, but health-related states or events in populations. And we apply this to study all sorts of health problems. So this can include the study of the natural course of a disease from onset to resolution, um, determining the extent of disease in a population, identifying patterns and trends in disease occurrence, so who's getting disease, where do they live, why are they getting it, why, how are they different from those that are not getting a particular disease. Um, we can also do work to identify the causes of disease, as well as evaluating the effectiveness of measures like public health interventions that are designed to prevent or treat disease. So the goals of the program are really to prepare you to do that work um, and more. Um, this is a professional degree program. So we're really focused on um, giving you the skills to be able to contribute to a research group, to a public health unit, to, <clears throat> to really um, apply your methodological and analytical techniques to address health problems. So we focus on a lot of applied skills, um, you know, giving you the foundation to be able to um, uh, quantitatively analyze, uh, analyze data to understand trends and patterns of disease, identify causes of disease, also to understand and critique the literature that might be associated with this, assess the impact of, inter in, uh, of interventions, all really sort of framed the, within the context of basic public health principles and practice. Now, epidemiology is a quantitative discipline. So um, a lot of the focus is on that particular area. And so what we start off with is um, a first two terms. So the fall and the winter term of your first year of the program is a sort of a foundational, sets the foundation, right? So this is where you're going to take two foundational courses in biostatistics in epidemiological methods, applied epicy, uh, epidemiology and policy. And all of this really is to prepare you for what I think is the cornerstone of the program, which is a core practicum experience where you go and you work in a research or applied setting for the summer. And this is a chance for you to get into the workplace, work with real data, answer a real question, uh, address a real um, public health problem. Following that summer, you come back for another term of courses, and this is your chance to really explore and specialize. So you can take more advanced methods and quantitative courses. You can focus on specific content areas like cancer epi, genetic epi, uh, social determinants of health, global health, infectious disease. Really, this is your chance to sort of diversify or specialize. And that depends on what it is that your, um, what your career goals are. So that's the fall term of your second year. In the winter term, um, this is a chance for you to do an optional second practicum. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So I would say most of our students end up doing the optional second practicum. Um, the other option is to continue taking uh, courses like electives that, um, you know, uh, but to sort of fill these gaps that you're interested in um, exploring. So the core courses in your first fall term consist of uh, an intro to public health course, um, which is multidisciplinary. All of the incoming MPH students from all the divisions at the school uh, take this course. 
You then take, um, have a series of required courses, Biostats 1, Epidemiology Methods 1, Population Perspectives, and then a core policy course, which is also taken by um, students in other disciplines, and then up to one elective. In the second term, you move to take the more advanced Biostats and Epi Methods courses, take an applied Epi course in Health Trends and Surveillance, and then a course on critical appraisal of evidence through um, scientific overviews, and then again, another elective. So beyond those required courses, the rest is really up to you. And this, this is also uh, with respect to the practicums that you choose to do, and then the electives that you choose to um, address. So if you're interested in social determinants of health, infectious disease, infant maternal health, global health, AI and health. I mean, this, this list goes on and on. Um, we have the capacity to provide the training in these, in these areas. Um, and so um, really you can choose to specialize or you can choose to diversify and really come up with a, a nice range of skills to be applied uh, in your future work um, experiences. So as I mentioned, the practicums are really that first mandatory summer practicum is really the cornerstone. And I really see this as a real turning point for students. There's a tremendous amount of growth that occurs just in quite a short period of time, just over that summer. Um, the, I'm, the optional second practicum uh, occurs in that second year. And we, we coordinate these for you. Um, the optional second practicum is one that you have to work to find yourself, though we do provide postings for this. But for this mandatory practicum, you were guarantee, we guarantee that you will find a position. And we have a, to do this, we have an internal job board that is just for current MPH students, where investigators, PIs, researchers um, can post their positions for practicum students. Um, and these are only available to you. So it's not, um, they're not broadly um, advertised outside of the MPH program. And then to support this application, you still have to apply to these positions. We provide you with um, lots of professional development opportunities. We give you support in drafting cover letters, your CV, how to, um, how to do an interview and all this type of thing, how to develop your LinkedIn profile, <laughs> you know, all, all of these sorts of things. To support, uh, to support you as you prepare to enter the job market. So, okay, so that epi first practicum, it must be quantitative, um, and then you need to write about it. So you need to be able to take some data, analyze the data, interpret it, and write about it and communicate the information, okay? Um, and these can be done in a variety of professional or research settings, and most will receive a small stipend. More and more, we are pushing for um, investigators to provide stipends to their students because your work is valued and you have important skills. So the optional second practicum can be one of two things. It could be a chance to try a new thing, something different. Maybe if you worked at a research institute in your first practicum, now you want to go and work at Public Health Ontario or the Public Health Agency of Canada to get a different experience in a different setting. Um, or you can actually um, choose to do something where you stay even with the same people that you did your first practicum with um, in that uh, to sort of get something that's more akin to a, um, a, a thesis type experience where you can do a more in-depth analysis. You've acquired mo more skills by that point and you can often do uh, something that's a little more in-depth. Now in past years, um, this second practicum has been an opportunity for students to do practicums outside of Canada. Um, of course, this is a bit up in the air now because of COVID. Um, and so um, right now that's not happening, but um, uh, you know, TBD as we move uh, forward through the pandemic here. So really you, you can use these practicums and your courses to find and focus uh, or diversify as you see fit. And then our students go and take these, take these skills and apply them in a lot of different settings. Um, so many go and work for uh, government, you know, the provincial level, um, think agencies like Public Health Ontario or different public health units, um, the federal government, um, you know, more local regional public health units and so on. You can see that there are those that continue on in higher education. 
Um, and this is a little bit misleading because I would say that a lot of our students do go and work in this area and then um, some will return um, to uh, higher education um, following that. Okay, so the application process. This year, the applications are due January 17th. The applications are open, so um, you can start, start this application now, and you should, okay? Because this can take some time to put together a good application. Um, the components of it are listed here, and I'm gonna talk about each of these briefly. Now, your letter of intent is a very, very important aspect of your application. Um, most of the other pieces, um, you know, we look at your transcripts, we look at, look at letters of reference, but this is your chance to tell us stuff that we can't really see on paper necessarily, right? So this is a free form essay. It's not very long, so you don't have much space to do it. It's about a thousand words. And this is your chance to outline why you want to, why you're applying to this program, what it is you want to do, talk about your background and how it might have prepared you for it. And really just tell us about your goals and what you what you want to do with that degree. Um, and, you know, really, this is also a chance to sort of highlight any sort of lived experience, life experiences that have uh, contributed to your desire to study epidemiology. Your CV uh, should be pretty standard. Um, you know, many of these pieces you won't you won't have robust uh, sort of uh, sections on like the publications and presentations may not have any publications or presentations at this career stage, um, but this is a chance to highlight any sort of research activities that you've had. If you've worked in a lab over the summer, if you completed an undergraduate thesis, um, this is a chance to highlight those, and those can also then be linked in your um, letter of intent as well. Okay, so there are um, there are like academic eligibility requirements that are not specific to our school. These are um, School of Graduate Studies um, SGS requirements. You need to have a qualifying undergraduate honors degree. You, it's basically a four year degree um, where you take progressively more advanced courses, right? So we want to see you moving through 100, 200, 300, 400 level courses through a four year degree. And the minimum academic standing for that um, degree is a mid B um, in the final five most senior level courses, okay? Um, and you can get more details about this um, through our, our website. And I also recommend looking at the SGS website as well. So applicants, um, you know, the, the mid B average is a minimum, um, is really a minimum uh, we need, uh, the application process is very competitive and we expect mostly A's and B's. We wanna see strong marks in those more challenging courses, right? We wanna see that you have moved through and been able to um, be successful at those higher level courses. Um, we also want to see strong grades in um, statistics and math to show that you have quantitative ability. Um, it's also nice to be able to see courses um, where you've had to do some writing, which I know can be challenging if you come from a health sciences degree, um, but those would be courses to highlight as well. So the statistics requirement is one specific uh, program specific requirement that we have. Um, so you need to have at least one term long university credit that is transcript, okay? It needs to be transcripted, it needs to be something that's on a transcript. Um, where you have uh, completed, I'll show you the list of specific criteria, and you need to have achieved a minimum grade of a B plus. Um, and um, this is really, um, you know, this, this, this one is also the, often the one that gives uh, students the, the most uh, sort of anxiety and trying to figure out whether the courses that they have cover, cover this material. So this is on the website. You can see all the lists of the um, different um, statistical content that we need you to be comfortable with. Um, the B plus is a mini minimum, but A's are preferred, okay? And this can be done in one course or a combination of courses. Um, so when it comes to listing your statistical requirement in your application, you can list multiple courses and they may not be called biostatistics. They might be called methods in community health or I don't know, anything like that. Um, and you, so you, in that instance, you need to provide an example of the syllabus 
um, or you know something that shows the content that um, is covered by that particular course. It is your responsibility to make sure that the courses or the course or the courses that you've taken meet those statistics requirements. Okay, um, I. I can't review everybody's courses. We get lots of applicants and I, I can't go and look at um, the syllabi for all these different statistic courses from all over the world to tell you uh, whether it meets the requirements. So this is something that you need to show and you need to make clear to the um, people who are gonna be reviewing your application, okay? For internationally trained students, um, English language proficiency is a requirement. There is a ton of information about this on the SGS website. And that also includes, if this is the link right here, this also includes equivalency grades for those who are looking to see whether their grades at their international institute um, meet the minimum requirements um, by SGS standards, okay? So all international universities are listed here and it tells you how to translate your grades into um, those for equivalent to a Canadian university. So the admissions committee assesses the full package of what of your submission. So we are looking for those quantitative skills. We're looking um, for any experience in research, um, writing and communication skills. So that another opportunity to show us how well you're able to do that is in your letter of intent. Um, we do require some human health knowledge, right? So you need to understand, this is a health discipline. Um, you need to understand, uh, you need to understand the context with which, in which you'll be working. Um, and we also, this is a professional degree. So we want to see maturity, professional skills, interpersonal skills. And we, you really want to convince us that this program is the one for you, that this is a good match for you, that'll help you reach your career goals, that you have the skills that are, uh, that are needed in order to make you successful within the program, and that you will be able to contribute to the program and the other students in the community. Okay, so this is another chance uh, to show those pieces of information is in your CV, right, to show any work experience, um, places where you've been able to show leadership, um, or if you've, um, so that gets at things like other employment, if you have done any sort of research experience, this is your chance to highlight there. Um, but it, this is also a place to put experience from volunteer work, other student positions, um, and you know, really showing commitment to a quantitative approach to, you know, to studying things. So we want to see that this, that epidemiology is going to, is the right choice for you. Okay, so how to apply. Do your research, read about the program. You're already here attending these sessions. So that's, that's a good, um, that's a good start. Um, and sort of reflect on what it is that you uh, want to do and what your go goals are. So what are your strengths? What are your accomplishments and what, what do you want to be doing in five years, 10 years? Okay, so plan the application. This takes um, time. Uh, in particular, your letter of intent and um, your references. Um, you wanna really make sure that your references have adequate time to write you a letter. Um, we all write many of these um, and it can, you know, it can get to be quite uh, burdensome. So you wanna make sure that your um, references have enough time to provide the thoughtful letter that you'll need. Um, and um, yeah, so just make sure that you give yourself enough time. We want um, the best applications. Um, you know, obviously you, you don't want any missing information. Uh, at the time of application, you, can, you don't have to provide official transcripts. Um, you can just be scanned copies. Um, but it must list the course titles and give you individual grades, okay? But these can be like the unofficial transcripts that you can get online uh, without requesting them formally. We wanna see your statistics requirement. We wanna see these letters of recommendation, which really need to capture specifics. They need to be able to comment specifically on your skills, okay? So the Dalhana website is a, has a ton of information about the program and how to, how to apply. Um, the SGS website also has um, lots of information in particular for international students. Um, that's where you can get a, a lot of that information. 
Um, Matilda Kong is the admin for the MPH program. Um, so she is a good resource. Um, and then I'm the pro program lead. Um, and I will stop uh, recording now and I will take questions. <laughs>